Greetings to everybody. Thanks very much to um, Marco, Matteo, and Alessia, and all people involved from the department for giving us this uh, splendid occasion to get together once more. At one point, we talked about uh, about uh, Blindside Circus, but on this occasion, this may be a bit too irrespectful. So, but uh, get together and talk about some things that we all, in one way or another, have cared about. So, in the spirit of um, the meeting where we all try to explain to each other, uh, or at least put a spin on our narrative, um, I'd uh, like to start, uh, spend a couple of lines how I met Larry. Uh, I met Larry the first time um, when we organized the founding meeting for the European Society for Philosophy and Psychology, the famous of infamous for the first five years, uh, ESPP. Um, the year before, actually, that was in Durham. I sort of forgotten about that. I had cajoled Martin Davis into having a having a pre-founding meeting uh, after we had sort of pre-pre-founded the society in my kitchen in Brussels. We decided, hey, yeah, why 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 don't we do it? And that time was the International Congress of Psychology, and um, we decided to go ahead have a meeting and uh, offer to Larry the honorary presidency. We didn't really want to make him president because we were a little bit suspicious of having him any power or any say in anything. So we made him honorary president. Martin and I then were executive presidents, both of us. In fact, that society didn't have a president for many years. <laughs> Good. Um, so I've, uh, of course, uh, seen Larry, a lot of Larry, uh, a lot of Larry for many years after that, but it took a while before we started doing some get something together on Blindside because uh, that is a different, uh, somewhat different story. Uh, at the time I met Larry, uh, I was of course employed, uh, employed as um, a teacher, as a professor of philosophy of science. And uh, there are these scientists, I, I, I met Larry, I knew very well uh, Paul Bertelson and Dick Held my three introducers to, the, to uh, all, this, all this kind of work. And uh, what they expected from me, not, maybe not personally, but uh, from my species, philosophers, they expected that it would help them clean up the language, as Joe said at one point, clean up the language or put it a bit more, uh, a bit more, uh, a bit more uh, ambitiously, uh, work a little bit at the conceptual confusion that was uh, a dominant uh, in the view of some people in science. But somehow I didn't feel like doing that. And at that time, there was an issue people worked on, especially Paul Bertelson worked at that time, which was ventriloquism. And that belongs to the more general issue uh, to, on the role of consciousness in putting stimuli from different modalities together. There was a debate that is still uh, going on, if I go by the title of the papers, that somehow uh, binding of input from the auditory system and with the input from the visual system or from the tactile or from the, from the synesthetic, uh, et cetera, that you needed awareness of the two stimuli, otherwise you would not, like, you would not uh, uh, bring those inputs together. And, um, my, my friends wanted to do an experiment on that, and I said, well, on, on the issue of what the role of consciousness, and I said, well, let's maybe try, try this, this apparently famous patient who has non-conscious vision. So we had, I asked Larry at that time, can we, can we bring GUI to the lab and do this ventriloquism experiment, which we did. And they gave very complicated results, which I would have to look up to talk, to talk about it properly. But while they were all away, I mean, all me meaning uh, Larry, Paul, and Jean, who was my uh, was my um, um, postdoc at the time, uh, I did something else. I said, well, look, if there is an issue about the role of consciousness in putting stimuli from different mod sensory modalities together, then it should work in this most natural of circumstances, namely speech and, by extension, audiovisual uh, communication of emotional signals. So that's how, like, via a sort of somewhat, somewhat uh, indirect route, this work on blindside, on, on affective blindside, then started. And as mentioned already this morning, we did a bunch of experiments, which I, which I sort of uh, uh, 
get got out of my head on the spot of making sure that at least we know a little bit what we were talking about in those first experiments. Okay, since a couple of things have, ha have happened, and uh, I've always been very concerned and very, uh, very uh, motivated, if not worried, if not anxious, uh, to make sure that we find something similar, uh, some similar phenomena, and it's not clear what similar is in this case, but some comparable phenomena in, uh, brain, in intact brains. And that's mainly what I'm going to talk about, although I'll make the link to some of those things. Given this complicated situation, I'm going to sit down. Okay. Um, so I moved, I moved the battlefield a little bit from uh, 10 years ago from people working, people working on faces. Everybody somehow seems to like to work on faces. And uh, I said, well, what about the rest of the, rest of the social scene? What about um, whole body expressions? Okay. And that was, that's, of course, also something we did, in, uh, we did with, those, uh, with the blindside patients. So the body is sort of interesting because it's, of course, an object of perception. But it's also very often a representation of an action. And next, it's of course an expression of an emotion, if not a tool for your emotional action. Those things go together. And that's made, that makes for, a, for, of course, a complicated stimulus. But most natural stimuli tend to be somewhat complicated. Um, the standard view in the field has been, and still is, uh, that um, the visual stream and that processing in the in the temporal uh, uh, stream is basically dedicated basically has this kind of functionality of assigning categories to the, vis to the visual objects it encounters in real life. So there you have these notions that there are all those little patches in visual cortex that in, uh, in of course, in extra stride cortex in IT that um, are specialized for an object category. Okay? Now, and people have found dissociations. Things got a bit complicated because in our field, people first find one area that does it. Then five, five to seven years later, it, they find that the second area also does it. If you go a little bit further, there's a third, and it's, so it goes on. And there is comparatively little concern um, for um, better understanding what those areas do. And um, so you get a typical picture, and, I'm, and, and you will see that I'm a little bit unhappy with that. The typical picture is indeed that you have this uh, processing. The <laughs> in real life, whatever your, your emotional reactions are about, they are likely to be, object, to be about objects or people around you. So as I think uh, Fadiga remarked, somebody remarked just, just recently, we have to bring the, the theory of visual perception in contact with the theory of, of how emotions are processed. We cannot just make that to be two different worlds. And how can we do that? In the very first study we did on emotional body expressions, uh, we used still stimuli. That's another story, but that's not maybe not the time for that. And we actually do find, did find at that time that the whole, we, in a bu bunch of areas uh, were activated and that clustered together. This is the, the activations you find when you contrast a body involved in an instrumental action. We always use bodies that do uh, representations of people doing something. Okay? And at that time, my motivation was that uh, when, when you're going to show a bodily, ex a bodily expression of emotion, there's going to be implicit motion perception. So we, have, we had at least to control for that by having uh, bodily images that are involved in actions. So we find all those areas which are only one-fifth of them, just to loosely quantify, only one-fifth of them are areas directly related to the visual object perception. So something else has to be going on there when we perceive uh, this kind of naturalistic stimuli. We did a bunch of TMF studies, and I'm only going to talk about the third one. So I to pull apart the, the networks both in, visuals, in, in the visual system and in, in, the, in, the tem, in, the, in the visual system and in the parietal system to see which ones were involved. In. And we were in this study, I'm only talking about the third one now, particularly interested in the role of uh, interparietal, uh, in, of inferior parietal lobule because, because its connections both to all sorts of cortical areas, but also to subcortical areas. Of course, still uh, continuing this notion that this might be relevant. In this TMS study, we cho choose uh, just uh, three areas. You can't do much more in, uh, in this kind of, in this kind of, with this kind of method. And we wanted to know what the, imp the impact was on, uh, on uh, stimulating uh, early v V1, let's say, let's be safe and say early visual cortex on uh, using um, on uh, IPL up there. And still, we wanted to take along, along, the, along for the ride the uh, so-called body area. 
this, the, task is, the task in this study was simple because, as in most of the tasks I've used in the lab, chosen to use in the lab, we never ask about emotional recognition. We try to avoid by all means that people have to, have to use verbal labels, but also have to depend on a system of explicit recognition of emotions. Okay. So here, all they had to do is uh, get the first stimulus, a, big, a small mask and an interval, and then simply say whether the second was different from the first. Okay. And uh, these stimuli were actually taken from, video, from frames of video clips. So there was a minimal, a minimal change in movements for those. So what we find, and I'm really summarizing this very quickly, what we find is that in this thing, that all, the only area of the tree we, we stimulated, uh, inferior parietal lobule was the only one that was significantly, sing, that, that was significantly influenced to behavior, the detection behavior of the subjects. Okay. So EBA was totally oblivious to what went on. Uh, early visual cortex was a bit more interesting, and here we confirmed the previous study, or some, some people did, that um, early visual cortex, let's just, uh, yeah, let's call it early visual cortex, that it actually decreased in accuracy for the neutral body condition, for the neutral body movements, but uh, was not, uh, but stimulating it did absolutely not influence fearful body postures. So there is, that of course goes a little bit in the, in the direction of what some blind sight studies uh, have reported. Okay. Now, um, just harking back to an, a study we did a while ago with Marco, which actually we did here, the first time Larry uh, came to Torino with the two, with the two blind sight paper, uh, paper, uh, patients at the time, and uh, where we wanted to, where we wanted to see to what extent we found we found uh, a change in the electrical activity of the facial muscles measured with uh, EMG, and what we get uh, what we get in the sighted field is of course perfectly normal. What we get, you may have seen this. So I'm going to fast through it. What we may have seen, what uh, what you see in the in the contralateral to the lesion field, depending on the patient's right or left, is that you see very much the same picture with that major difference, with two things to remark here. One is that um, the um, latency is much shorter in the blind field, and um, that there is no difference, and I sort of like this point, and not everybody may share my enthusiasm for this, uh, I like this, this notion that whether or not the stimuli were faces or were whole bodies, as you see, uh, there is just no difference. Okay, so what we are tapping into here is a reaction to the valence of the stimulus and not any kind of contagion process as uh, it has sometimes been argued. I don't think this, this EMG can be taken as evidence for contagion, but that's uh, uh, good. Um, just to mention one, uh, one complementary study, then um, indeed we have evidence for uh, for evidence for processing of different object categories, but the evidence here is stronger when the, when the blind side brain or the non-conscious brain or even the seeing brain, we always find more different but more activations when we show body stimuli than when we show facial, facial stimuli. Now, now let's now go to the part where, uh, to the part where we try to see how much we can get um, how much clarity we can generate, how much answers we can generate by using, by using situations not, we've used a bunch, a bunch in the past, we've used uh, uh, rivalry, masking of course, then rivalry we were not very happy with. Now we've been using continuous flash suppression in, uh, in a number of subjects. I guess some of you are, most of you are familiar with. It's sort of, it's basically, um, it's basically a way of masking the, of making invisible, I wouldn't say mask, of making the stimulus invisible, and the creation of invisibility can last for quite a long time, so it's fairly stable, etc. Fairly stable, you don't have to use uh, uh, very short presentations, although you do for all sorts of other reasons, but that's what you do there. So you have then this person. So this is sort of hard to do because for reasons that nobody clearly understands yet, there is a huge individual variability with the subjects with, in which that phenomen phenomenon works. It's not related just to blinking, but um, some people are very stable suppressors. They just suppress very stably every time you test them. So we try to have, get a cohort of people who will systematically have suppression of the stimulus in this kind of CFS uh, upset uh, setup. And we, we uh, took them to the scanner, 
I'm going to skip one study because we did a behavioral study which is published. So you have to talk about ramping. You have to be careful about how you ramp up the, the presentation of the stimulus because you don't want the ramping up to be the cause of, uh, you were uh, just talking about that, right? You don't want to ramping. I'm just going to skip the behavioral data to go to the, to the uh, fMRI data. So we did this kind of study in the, um, in the scanner with, uh, with very good suppression uh, subjects. We did not give them any task because that would have, would have interfered. We pre-tested them a number of times that they were really stable suppressors, and we tested them after the session also. But we didn't give a task uh, during, during the scanning. Okay, so our goal was uh, our goal was to see to what we, we in this study we only used bodies we used upright and inverted as we as we usually do sometimes we use Fourier scrambled stimuli we try to do as much as we can in terms of sensible controls so the ramping up was uh, took quite quite a while as you see there the noise such that there was no discontinuity in the sudden appearance of the stimuli and the, the flash suppression really worked completely. So what we, get, uh, in the, what we get in these results, and I'm going to quickly go to the message of it, is that in terms of, of, visual, of visual areas, um, early visual cortex and ventral, we get a very clear uh, reduction of activation for the, non, for, the, for the condition where the stimuli are non, not seen. There's still some activation, but it, it, it's a very big it's a very big reduction of activation. Okay? <laughs> However, when you go to the dorsal areas, you see that uh, that uh, that uh, the dorsal cortical areas are insensitive to whether or not the stimuli are seen or not. So you find a very clear difference between the, between the ventral and the dorsal stream for the role of, of uh, conscious vision of the stimuli. When the stimuli are not consciously seen, or where they are, when they are seen, it does not make a difference for those, uh, for the, especially here for the three sections of, uh, of IPS. Okay? So that's, that, that's is, uh, it's not that the dorsal stream deals with non-conscious perception, it just seems to be, at least from this study, that it's insensitive to the distinction. We don't find less or more activity when the stimuli are seen or not seen. So that's a summary of that. Interestingly, um, okay, we, um, but that's work in progress, so I'm actually going to, probably going to skip these slides. Uh, if this would work, it would of course be a nice paradigm to do um, some work that, uh, that Carlo Marzi started for, started for a while and that offers a very, very useful paradigm for indirect measure of blind sight also, namely bilateral presentation of the... So it's a little complicated, of course, to have, to have a double continuous flash suppression, both in the right eye and both in the left eye, but that seems to work and that seems to work, uh, work rather nicely. <laughs> so you can get this, con can this condition that half of the visual field you fuse, but it's rather than being in the center. And that is as close as we can get uh, currently for, uh, for, uh, repeating, uh, for repeating the finding of redundant target effects in uh, the intact brain. Okay. Right now, as Elisabetta hinted already, the results are a little bit different from what we find in blind cells, but I'm not going to go into the results. Let's uh, just put, uh, um, let put, let put one comment up here. The area we also find in the redundant, in the continuous flash suppression, we also find uh, activity in subcortical structures, and that happens to be the, in here, in left pulvinar and caudate, and that happens to be, uh, if you look at a uh, paper from, um, from uh, Karn, from Otto Karnat, uh, in patients with, uh, with subcortical neglect, those are exactly the same areas that seem to be involved uh, in, in those patients that have subcortical neglect and that we find that are activated for the non-seen stimuli. Okay. Good. Uh, a little bit more. Uh, of course, time course of all this processing is very important. And one of my, um, one of my teams, uh, besides wanting to replicate uh, see whether we can find evidence for non-conscious vision in, uh, in the intact brain. Another, another issue, of course, is that of the time course. And um, my notion that uh, there is a, a significant, a significant um, portion of, of analysis of the stimulus that can go on in the dorsal stream relatively independently 
of this categorization in the ventral stream. Because that's really a very important point uh, that, uh, that I'm trying to, trying to clarify. And it's a little bit, it goes a little bit against the mainstream view uh, that you would have, that you would have uh, all that processing that goes, sort of goes on in parietal, in parietal cortex before, or before, now I come to the timing issue, but relatively independently of the categorization of the stimulus. Because the standard image, of course, is if you look at the whole face literature, you first encode the face as a face in all those nice face areas, and then start the analysis, the expression recognition, the identity, the speech, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And what I'm trying to push for is, is, is a different image, where there, a different picture, where there is a lot of processing that goes on in the, in the dorsal stream, especially for, for stimuli with high valence, high arousal, related to emotion and to action. Okay? And that's a, and <laughs> so that, of course, one argument to make that point would be an argument from timing. And uh, for that purpose, we uh, used um, MEG in one study, um, where you know, the details don't matter. We, I'm just showing you part of the data because here also we had Fourier scrambled images, uh, upright inverted, and the whole uh, ringamorole of, of controls for that kind of thing. And what you see here is sort of what you see here is when you compare the critical comparison uh, of of the neutral versus the neutral versus the very active body image you have there because. It's, this is one of a person combing his hair, something like that. We have various actions we, we use there. That, that's the very first evidence for a distinction between the two in favor of the emotionally laden stimulus is in the window, which is relatively early, in the window of 80 to 100 milliseconds, and is in those areas there. Okay? As you see there, that cluster of areas. This is uh, fMRI constrained MEG, and uh, you can make nice movies with that instead. So that certainly, play. if I would give you the full set of data, you would see that there is that there is uh, different stages uh, through which that through which the processing goes. But the first evidence for there being a difference, a market for a difference between the neutral and the emotional instrumental, is is at that time in those areas. Okay. Uh, just a word about uh, some other word, because of course, uh, it's, I think it's essential that we try to find evidence comparable to the, those very few blindside patients. We try to find evidence in the intact brain, and a bunch of different uh, techniques can be used for that. I'm just giving you some examples. But one that hasn't used very much, been used very much, is actually capitalizing on mental imagery. So we did one study, uh, and we should do much more on that, one study where at the same time that we presented stimuli in the unseen uh, hemifield, we gave imagery instructions. And we tried to see whether to, to what extent there was actually an impact, an impact of the visual imagery instructions. Now just imagine a simple situation. I say, close your, eye, close your eyes so you can keep them open if you prefer. Close your eyes and imagine a very juicy apple. And at the same time, I show you up here, here. Okay? So you, there's something is something is going on, and I think we tend to neglect to neglect this <laughs> funny word in this context to underestimate the impact of mental imagery on um, on visual perception, especially when we do experiments that that deal with sort of critical uh, critical variables. Uh, it's the system, of course. It's not. I mean, the brain. The, we give instructions, and often we give instructions by saying it's an apple or a pear. And as though I said, we try to avoid giving instructions, is it happy or sad? But still, in some cases, you do have to use those, if only for the CD side field. So um, there, is, uh, there are various experiments to do in the future, and in this case, rather than next doing them with the intact brain and first doing them with the, with the, with the patients, you can also first do them in the intact brain. And this one, that's, that is one, this one is one that waits to be, done with, uh, to be done with patients. It's sort of funny, so I'm offering you, it to you for your afternoon ent entertainment. Uh, it was a little... Uh, a little um, what we, do, what we do here is, uh, I did a long time ago an experiment in Boston with a prosopagnosic patient where we used tactile recognition of identity. Yeah. Now, in those days, it sounds far away, even if it's only 10 years ago, we had to make casts of individual faces. So we had a big suitcase of stimuli, and they consisted of, I think, 32 plaster plaster faces, different individual faces, and they had to be recognized in the tactile mode. And it's one of those interesting cases where people are actually better at that than they think they are. 
Okay, so we, that's how we tested prosopagnosics. So. <laughs> From that, I started playing with the idea, what about tactile body recognition, which is a little bit too, more difficult to do. I mean, it would take more, one suitcase would take one stimulus if I have to make. I could use, of course, some Italian sculptures, but it's a bit difficult to have a whole, uh, a whole suitcase of. So we ended up finding this marvelous compromise of having 3D printed uh, bodies. So what we did, uh, based on motion capture files, which give you, of course, the, the 3D, the 3D of the whole body. You send those to the to the 3D printer, and out come those little those little figures, which you can then use to have people blindly, we blindfolded people to have people blindly recognize, uh, do tactile recognition with those images, and at the same time, at the, so there was various conditions. Uh, but the, the point of this is that uh, indeed. It turns out to be to be remarkably uh, remarkably uh, clear. I would almost say, um, if you do like like cross category classify, uh, classification uh, analysis of your, of your data, you see to what extent your imagery data predict your um, perceptual data, and the other way around. You do see that per, per sensory modality, there is a very a very convincing way in some, in some areas of the brain at least, that you can predict from your imagery data what your perceptual data are gonna be and the other way around. Okay. So that I'm just plugging this one here in here to see that I think mental imagery of the stimulus and its similarity with perception or failed perception in some patients is something that has to be taken into account. Okay, sorry, that's, uh, okay, back to uh, now to round this off. Uh, after, the, after we published the 99 paper uh, with Larry, um, there was a comment by, um, by Bob and Charlie at the time, and we replied to that, and the title of that one was, Are We Blindly Led by Emotions? That's, of course, a question that can, uh, we can debate that has already come up, and we can debate for some longer time. Um, and it's a very complicated question. Um, it, it's a complicated question. Uh, a couple, I'll just, just say a couple of things about it. One, uh, one thing, and that came already up in, uh, in Joe's talk, one thing to realize is that non-conscious perception, and certainly for the case of emotions or of carriers of emotional information like faces, bodies, voices, etc., I don't think we can look upon that as percep perception minus consciousness. Now, that's easier said than done because, in fact, uh, and that's what, and, and, uh, that's what the goal was of my, of my distinction between the, the temporal and the parietal uh, uh, processing stream because there is a stage in the brain uh, where we react to that face and to that body that antedates the, fa the fail-safe categorization of that stimulus as we tend to think of it when we, do, when, when we look simply at what happens in the inferior temporal cortex. Okay? So there is an amount of it, there is some information, of course, that's taken, that the brain takes from the stimulus, takes from the stimulus pretty fast, but it's not dependent on this prior categorization of the stimulus in uh, IT cortex. In IT. And that's, and that's an important question. It's also an important question for, uh, for uh, what categories we use to describe non-emotional processing. We already heard a little bit about the notion of basic emotions, etc. I mean, if I would be a radicalist, uh, which I prefer not to be this afternoon, then I would say that, you'd, that at the level of non-conscious processing, those basic emotions just, I mean, as, as Joseph said, the, the, those, that fear, that fear system does not exist. I mean, that does not exist when we tap into the, into the life of the organism limited to, limited to or framed only as those subcortical structures. But to some extent, the same counts for the concepts of our everyday life, for the concepts which we use to categorize, to categorize the objects in our everyday life. Yeah. So there may be some kind of phantom face or phantom body that is enough to trigger all those, all those uh, that that uh, that processing in parietal cortex, and that leads to uh, that leads to uh, actions, etc. So some processes related to valence, arousal, reward are, and that's an interesting issue, are stronger outside the realm of the conscious life. A, 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 sim, a similar finding to develop this theme is 
uh, people tend to cluster together voices, faces, and bodies. I mean, they all convey fear, or they all convey anger, or they all convey happiness. Okay, but that's I think that's that's a, that, that's a, a misrepresentation of what's really going. It's only when we use those categories to classify, to classify what happens at the conscious conscious intention and soul life that we find that faces and bodies convey the same emotion. Okay, when you get into more more details, you don't. And as I already hinted at, our emotion concepts do not have the same reference in non-conscious and conscious processes. And that's an and that's a very big that's a very big complication for future research. But that I think it's one we have to we have to acknowledge. Okay? Now to end aside from some acknowledgments, to end um, with a joke, of course, how can we end otherwise than with Larry's joke? Larry and I have for a long time sh shared sort of somewhat off-edge off jokes, and my one and, my one and only favorite, uh, no, no, my, my absolute favorite um, is some, something I use. It's one I use and I quote all the time, but I really use it in daily life, so is, here is the joke. Larry, as, as told by, as repeated by me after I'm told by Larry. So there is two friends, they are two friends walking and talking. Uh, I hope not on consciousness, but walking and talking. But they get close, they are absent-minded and they get close to a cliff, okay? And the inevitable happens, one falls off. And the other one gets worried, not in mid-sentence, but at the end of the paragraph, gets worried and says, hmm, Jeff, how are you? Leaning over the cliff and looking. And the, other, and the other replies after a slight delay, so far so good, I'm still falling. So that's for as far as the research goes, we are still falling, but we are falling deeper and hopefully deeper and deeper into some understanding. And I take the bad example from, uh, from my pre previous speakers and advertise a book because the publisher wants that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bea. Time for questions. So, Bea, um, as you probably know, I record or have recorded a lot from single neurons. And they're not telling you in the ventral visual system about categories very much. Is it a face or is it a body? They're doing something totally different. They're telling you whose face is it. Um, <clears throat> and that information is then transmitted forward to the orbitofrontal cortex, which then knows about identity and about facial expression. So the point I'd like to make is that um, <clears throat> basically when we have emotions to stimuli, it depends who is making the expression. If it's one particular individual who's smiling at me, that's great. If it's someone else, I'm a little bit surprised and the same for an angry expression. So, as I understand it, you're mainly dealing with categories of face, bodies, and so on, or with it's a smile or it's a sad expression. So, to what extent have people in blindsight had a look at it's this individual person making this particular facial expression? which I think would be an interesting question because that would tell you whether you're really engaging ventral visual cortex. There's a, bu a bunch of different questions there, but let me, let me uh, reply rapidly. First of all, uh, one of the differences I want to stress and uh, more than I have been able to do here between faces and bodies is that what you say about faces doesn't count for bodies. We did one study, we published one study recently where you have two rather than always using a single stimulus, we use two faces and in other conditions, two bodies, okay? And the amygdala is totally insensitive to the fact that there are two different individuals with a different expression. While for the bodies, you get an increase in activation when you have two bodies of the same emotion. And of course, it's comp it would be evolutionarily very, very disadvantageous whether we, if we would want to find to have that that bad guy come close by so that we can that we can ask for his ID. So <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm saying is, you really need some stimuli need to need already to be seen from a distance, and then personal identity does not matter. Okay, now back to the blind side. We did that with TN. 
I'm not sure we did it. Uh, we had this, this slightly funny finding, which we didn't clearly make, made the fuss about when I did a study with Ray Dolan, that the N was actually uh, sensitive to gender differences in the stimuli. We never took that, took that up, we never followed that up. Uh, but we didn't look at personal identity. Now with the N, we, looked, we took pictures of his family, family members and himself, and there was no recognition whatsoever. There was no difference between uh, what, uh, the, whether the photograph was over a noun or an unknown person. But of course, more things, more questions can be asked, more things can be done. So, but that's all, whether personal identity matters is again going to, going to depend on, on the level of processing you tap into in, for those uh, complex stimuli. 